The dichotomy between the sun and the moon is something that has fascinated many different cultures and civilizations since the beginning of recorded history. While often the sun is portrayed as a bringer of life and happiness and joy, in some cultures it might also be portrayed as an angry tyrant who beats down on the people below and seeks sacrifices to ensure their survival. And the same can be said for the moon. For every tale of the sun, there is one of the moon that presents it in a similar or completely opposite fashion. But one thing that kind of remains constant is that the relationship between the sun and the moon is always there. They're usually portrayed as two sides of the same coin, sometimes cooperating together, other times being polar opposites that don't get along. And the fantasy world of Dungeons and Dragons is no different. There are many creatures that have themes of the sun and the moon written into their lore, whether it be something that directs the creature and influences what they do the way the moon influences lycanthropes, or in the way that certain deities of the sun, such as Pelor, influences his followers and paladins of justice and righteousness. But something we don't have in 5th edition D&D is a pair of creatures that originally came from the books of Spelljammer, the Sun and Moon Dragons. And today, we're going to go into great detail about just what these creatures are and why they're so fascinating. Hello and welcome to Monster of the Week, the show where we dig through old versions of D&D and other related tabletop games and look for creatures that are fascinating, that have been lost to time, and bring them to light for use in your 5th edition game. My name is Dungeon Dad, also known as Josiah, and today we're going to be talking about a couple of creatures, and by a couple I mean eight different creatures from Spelljammer. And if you want to use these creatures or follow along as we're discussing them in this video, you can find the stat blocks in the description right underneath this video. Now, I realize some of you might not be familiar with Spelljammer, or in some cases might not even know what it is. So to understand Sun and Moon Dragons, we need to talk about that for just a quick second. Spelljammer was kind of a spin-off setting of AD&D, that basically was D&D in space. There were rules for magical vessels that could traverse the stars that used spell jamming power and all kinds of crazy creatures that inhabited many different planets. This is the setting that originally gave us creatures like the GIF, which were just printed in Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, the giant space hippos. It's kind of a crazy setting, but definitely a really fun one. And that's where we get the sun and moon dragons. These were creatures that lived respectively either on the sun or the moon of one of the many different worlds that existed within Spelljammer. And while they both may be celestial dragons, they could not be more different in terms of how they behave, what capabilities they have, and their views on other living creatures. So in today's video, we are going to talk about just exactly what makes these dragons so special, and we are going to kind of cover each one one at a time. And then of course at the end we'll go over some plot hooks that you could use for one dragon or the other, and of course some plot hooks that might involve both dragons kind of coming into contact in your world. Because while they may have originally been intended to encounter players who were traversing the vacuum of space, we have converted them to be used in your more typical fantasy fair setting for Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. So without further ado, we're going to talk about our first contender, the... Sun Dragons. They are benevolent, kind, jolly beings that originally resided upon the sun, but they have a thirst for adventure and a curiosity that often leads them down to the surface of whatever world their fiery home happened to be nearest to. The giant burning ball of fire up in the sky, also known as the sun, is the one thing that gives life to pretty much everything on the surface. And sun dragons are a perfect representation of that thought. They are kind, benevolent, 
willing to help out other living creatures at no expectation of reward or glory. And at the end of the day, they are happiest when they are discovering new things and on an adventure. It's for this reason that they spend so much time amongst other mortals. Sun dragons spend a very significant portion of their lives polymorphed magically into forms that resemble sun elves or other elven kind, specifically because they want to blend in, be treated as just any other sun elf might be treated, and of course spend many of their years going on adventures. It's for this reason that they can often be found on ships amongst crews that are traveling the world, whether they be pirates or merchants or anything in between. Because sometimes those two professions aren't always exactly separate from one another. But at the end of the day, they are simply concerned with just seeing and experiencing as much of the world and its beauty as they can. And that's saying a lot because sun dragons have an extremely long lifespan even for a dragon. It's not uncommon for a dragon to live several thousand years assuming no uppity adventurers come and try to take its horde, but a sun dragon can live for tens of thousands of years before it even starts to show signs of becoming ancient. And the age category of a sun dragon is much different than other dragons in the sense of how it looks. It still ages from wormling all the way to ancient. However, it doesn't exactly follow the same flow chart, so to speak. See, most dragons just get bigger and bigger and bigger as they age. And while this is true for sun dragons up until a point, they mimic the life cycle of a star, or in their case, specifically speaking, the sun. Which yes, the sun is a star, but we're just not going to talk about that. See, they are fairly large when they are first born, and they are a bright red color. And much like the sun, as they age, they do get bigger, but they eventually turn like a golden yellow, similar to our sun in the real world. And this usually marks the sign that they have entered adulthood. An adult sun dragon will be this brilliant yellow color and will be the biggest that it's really ever going to be. However, once a sun dragon starts to cusp on passing into that ancient category, which, as you will know, is when dragons in D&D start to get very scary with what abilities they have access to, they go from this brilliant yellow color to almost a pale bluish, kind of off-white color. But their color is not the only thing that changes. As their skin starts to sort of fade, they get a little bit smaller. And by the time they actually become ancient, Unlike all the other dragons, the chromatic dragons, metallic dragons, and even the moon dragons, which we'll talk about later, they don't become gargantuan when they enter the ancient stage of their life cycle. They become small. And I don't just mean smaller, they become literally the small size category. They shrink down to maybe the size of a dog, and their skin becomes a flat white color. Now by no means does this mean they're going to die soon, but it does mean they're entering probably the last few thousand years of their life. However, that is the only real difference here when compared to the other dragons because they are still just as powerful as any other ancient dragon. And for this reason, they're exceptionally dangerous because it would be very easy for someone to mistake an ancient sun dragon for a very young, possibly white dragon, or even a moon dragon, which would be just absolutely devastating for that group of adventurers if they tried to take one on. Granted, ancient sun dragons are not particularly common, but it is the risk that anyone who might encounter one of these creatures could run. One of the most fascinating things about this creature's life cycle as well is that when they do eventually die, what happens to an ancient sun dragon is similar to what might happen to a star in kind of a fantasy science fiction setting. And that is that it collapses in on itself, its body totally becomes just destroyed, and there's a chance that it will turn into either a sphere of annihilation, i.e. a black hole, 
or it might turn into a well of many worlds, i.e. a wormhole. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with what those objects are, a sphere of annihilation is literally just a black 10-foot sphere. I think it could be any size, but the one that the sun dragon turns into is a 10-foot sphere, and just anything that touches it is just destroyed immediately. There are very, very, very few objects, probably enough that you could count on one hand that might be able to survive passing through one of these things. And as for the Well of Many Worlds, that is literally a portal that will lead you to another plane. Now, there's no guarantee what plane you'll end up on, but it will definitely take you off the material plane and spit you out somewhere else. Now, this is probably something very few of us will ever experience either as a player or a DM, but it's just a very cool and interesting kind of detail about this creature and how it's meant to replicate the life cycle of an actual sun. Now, as far as combat goes, many of you are probably familiar with the dragon stat blocks that exist in the monster manual. And for those of you who aren't, let me tell you this, fighting a dragon sucks. <laughs> It depends, of course, on how the DM chooses to run it, but fighting a dragon is very, very difficult because they can fly so quickly and their breath weapons are just devastating. And of course, they have many claw, bite, tail, wing attacks that they throw in in between, and this dragon is no different. So I won't go super in-depth on how it has bites and claws because... All of that stuff is pretty comparable to other dragons that you've seen before. But what I will talk about is what makes this dragon different from other dragons that you've maybe seen before. And the first thing is that it has access to a couple of spells. Now something we do need to discuss really quickly is just how dragons gain abilities as they age, because dragons become more powerful the older they get. So many of their spell casting abilities, they don't have access to all of them right away. For example, the Sun Dragon has access to the Light spell, which is just a cantrip. It creates a light, makes sense for a dragon that is literally of the sun, uh, and it can do that from the Wormling stage right away. As soon as it's born, it can just create light. Makes sense. And it also gains access to an offensive spell, Heat Metal, which literally does exactly what it sounds like. It causes a piece of metal to heat up. And if that metal happens to be a sword someone else is wielding or some kind of weapon, there's a chance that they might drop it or get hurt by it. And if the object that they're heating up happens to be a suit of armor, well, good luck. Because that armor is going to become extremely hot and you will not be able to take it off by the time you are burned alive. But as I said, dragons become more powerful as they age and a spell the dragon gets access to much later in life is Prismatic Spray. And this is kind of meant to play off of this theme of light and the sun and how that can kind of be manipulated in different ways. And Prismatic Spray is a very powerful spell that has, I believe it's 10 different effects depending on how the dice is rolled. And those effects can range from doing a bunch of fire damage or acid damage or straight up teleporting you to another plane of existence, all kinds of crazy stuff. And it doesn't get that until it becomes again an adult or older. And once it becomes ancient, it can just do that at will, which is horrifying, but you're also talking about a creature that is above CR 20, so... The other thing that makes this dragon wildly different from any of the other dragons is its breath weapon. Many dragons breathe either a cone or a line of whatever their specific element is. For example, the red dragon, which is aligned with fire, breathes a massive cone of fire. Whereas the blue dragon, which is more associated with lightning, breathes a massive line of lightning. The sun dragon is very similar to the red dragon in the sense where it is associated with fire, but it's not just fire. We're talking about sunlight. We are talking about the most intense form of fire that we really know of. So the sun dragon's breath weapon does deal fire damage, but not just fire damage. It also deals radiant damage. It does a very high amount of damage when it uses its breath weapon, and that damage is split 50% into fire and 50% into radiant. Now this was something I kind of had to infer because Spelljammer and the way their rules and damage and stuff works out is very, very different from D&D that we know today. Because if you're immune to fire, you're still going to be taking some damage from the radiant portion of its breath weapon because this is like super heated fire. So even a creature like a tiefling who's normally resistant to fire is still going to feel the heat coming off of this dragon's weapon. Another thing that makes this breath weapon unique though is the fact that it's not a simple cone or line of radiant fire. 
The dragon literally spits out a small orb of fire that almost looks like a tiny sun that it can kind of cause to float off to whatever space it wants that small orb of fire to land in. And then once that's there, nothing happens. It simply floats and it does emit some light, which is considered sunlight. Not that that is likely to be very relevant, but if there happens to be a vampire in the mix, RIP. But in any case, these little balls of sunlight that it can spit out using its breath weapon don't do anything until the dragon chooses to detonate them. It could simply spit one out and cause it to detonate, or it could spit out two or three and kind of have them set around and wait for the perfect moment to detonate its fireballs. But it does so regardless as a reaction at either the start or the end of another creature's turn. So it can wait until someone has moved into proximity of one of these fireballs, or it can simply cause it to hover there and lie in ambush. So it can wait until another creature or several creatures are within range of one of these fireballs. It also kind of creates a hazard on the map that the party is going to want to avoid if they happen to be fighting one of these things. Because once it chooses to detonate one of these fireballs, you do not want to be close by. So between the few extra spells it has and the way its breath weapon functions, I feel like this will take what could normally be considered just another dragon encounter and mix it up, which I think players who are very experienced with the game and may have fought several dragons before will find really enjoyable. Of course, once they're done cursing you as the DM for incinerating them alive. Now, as far as actually using this creature in your games go, the Sun Dragon can be a very good ally to any good or even neutral really aligned party. Or even an evil party who's really good at lying. Because Sun Dragons ultimately just want that sense of adventure. I mean, of course they care about treasure and all the things that dragons typically care about, but the true treasure for a Sun Dragon is the memories that it makes along the way. If I was going to use the Sun Dragon, I would make them as kind of this wandering adventurer whose hoard is literally just a stack of journals it keeps with it with writings all about the many places it's been and all the things it's seen. And a character like that could be a really great recurring kind of ally for the party who, if they ever have a question about where to find something, this is the person who would probably know about that. Maybe they don't even know that this person is a dragon if it's kind of disguised as another humanoid creature. They might just think it's a very old elf perhaps. Or maybe they go specifically to find this character because they know or at least they've heard rumors that this character is a sun dragon and perhaps they're going to fight something that hates sunlight like a vampire. Curse of Strahd would be a lot easier if there was a sun dragon hanging around that would help out the party. Or going back to what I said earlier at the beginning of the video, you could totally just change up the lore of this dragon if you like the creature but it doesn't really fit with your world. Maybe in your world the sun is considered a kind of evil entity. Maybe you're running a dark sun campaign and people don't like the sun because it's huge and it's burning everything alive that exists on the surface of whatever your world is. So perhaps in that instance, the sun dragon's role is kind of reversed and it's more of a tyrant king who rules over a kingdom. You could do many different things with this because theming of the sun, while it can be interpreted in many different ways, is ultimately just kind of there to be a base that you build on top of. So while Spelljammer's interpretation of what a sun dragon is and what I found kind of fascinating and what drew me to this creature, if that doesn't fit for you, then just change it up. Perhaps you even have a sun dragon who's the villain of your campaign who doesn't really see themselves as a villain and they're trying to just create a world of permanent daylight. Maybe they're trying to build like a second sun that rotates around the planet in tandem with the original sun. It doesn't realize how detrimental this would actually be to the ecosystem. Maybe the party's approached by a group of druids who have found out about this sun dragon's plot and originally they thought that this helpful creature was their ally and now realize this creature is much more dangerous than it even knows and either the party needs to go convince it to stop or maybe they convince it to stop with their blades. In either case, you're sure to have a memorable encounter when you're using a sun dragon. But this creature would be awfully lonely out in the stars without its counterpart. So we're going to take a moment now and move on to talk about...
the moon has always been a very fascinating piece of iconography, for me at least. When you think about the moon and what it represents and how it kind of ties into the many legends we have both in D&D and in real life, the themes are so powerful. We're talking about huge ideas like romance, mystery, the unknown, and of course, madness. So we're sun dragons are these brilliant, benevolent, kind creatures. Moon dragons are the total opposite. They possess an innate level of twisted cunning that even other dragons are fearful of. And much like the way the sun dragon kind of follows the life cycle of the sun, the moon dragon very much follows the same kind of cycle, or in its case, phases of the moon. When moon dragons are born, they are pure black, darker than even the darkest black chromatic dragon. Moon dragons are the absolute absence of light. However, after a time, seven days to be precise, a white kind of shadow begins to appear on one side of the dragon, and slowly that white mark will shift across the dragon's body until eventually it has completely taken over and the dragon is a stark white color. And then of course, after another seven days, a dark shadow begins to appear and overtakes the dragon, making it black once more. This of course, is a physical representation of the phases of the moon, and the moon dragon will replicate the same phase as whatever moon it was born on or born closest to. So if there's a full moon in the sky, the moon dragon will be pure white. And if there is a new moon, meaning it's pretty much completely black, the moon dragon will also be completely black. But this change doesn't represent just a mere cosmetic change. While it might look cool to see a moon dragon kind of transitioning from one phase to the next, that is not purely aesthetic. With this change comes a change in the dragon's personality, the way it behaves, what abilities it has access to, and of course, its alignment. In its new moon phase, when it is pure black, the dragon is at its most powerful. It is also lawful evil, meaning it's sensible. It abides by the laws of dragon kind, or at least its own code of laws. It behaves in a way that is logical. This phase of the moon also gives the dragon access to spells like Misty Step and Darkness. Things that kind of promote subterfuge and planning, cunning. It's also much more focused in its abilities, meaning all of its attacks deal a bit of extra damage. But I'm sure you're wondering, what happens when the moon dragon becomes fully white and it is a full moon? Well, at this point the dragon's alignment shifts from lawful evil to chaotic evil. This is when the dragon might not be at its most physically powerful, but its mental state is definitely the most unstable, and it has access to a lot more magic than it normally does. In its full moon phase, the moon dragon is a representation of madness. This is reflected by its ability to cast enthrall, hideous laughter, crown of madness, dominate person, spells that would compel people to do things they normally would never consider doing. Later in life, this also gives the dragon the uncanny ability to speak all languages. It can communicate with any creature. It does lose this when it passes on to the next phase, but during these seven days, its level of communication and manipulation are unprecedented. It also has sway over creatures that are tied to the moon in some way, specifically lycanthropes. Any lycanthrope that sees the moon dragon when it's in its full moon phase is immediately transformed into its animal form, no matter what. The lycanthrope also has to make a very difficult charisma save at disadvantage, and if it fails, it is placed under the effects of a domination spell by the moon dragon. And this is what's truly horrifying about these dragons, is all of their planning and cunning that they can get ready for during their new moon phase, when they go into their full moon state, they can dominate any lycanthropes and act upon it in a way that only a creature who is truly mad can do. 
And again, its physical attacks are very similar to other dragons that you've seen before, but these faces of the moon and these spells it gains access to is what makes this dragon truly special. And of course, when it's in that phase where it's transitioning, where half of it is black and the other half is white, it doesn't have the extra damage and physical prowess that it might have when it's in its new moon form, and it doesn't have the sway over lycanthropes that it might have as a full moon phase dragon, but it does get access to the full spell list of both phases of the moon, meaning it can cast those spells that cause madness and control, but it can also rein that in and use some of its more subtle spells for subtle manipulation. And of course, when it's in that transitioning phase, its alignment becomes neutral evil. The cold calculating logic is starting to fade, but it hasn't completely succumbed to madness just yet. And the other thing that makes this dragon special is its breath weapon. It is simply a cone, but it is not merely a cone of cold damage like the white dragon. It is a cone of black frost, which does cause cold damage, but this isn't just icy cold, something you would experience on the material plane normally. This is the cold vacuum of space. This is the cold that rips away that layer of heat that surrounds you and just destroys any warmth that could have existed there. This cold damage bypasses cold resistance and cold immunity. So there are very few creatures that can withstand this. And if you fail your save, there's also a chance you will be encased in black ice. If you can't break out of that black ice in time, or your party doesn't get you out of there in time, you will suffocate. You are trapped in that ice with only enough air to last you a few rounds. So you better start making those strength saves. One other minor feature that I gave this dragon, which is more thematic than anything, but it's something that I think makes them really special, is the moon in real life has a lot of control over the tides and water, and it has more effect on us than we really realize. And for this reason, I gave the Moon Dragon access to control water at will. Now, this isn't a huge, like, life-changing spell that it will be able to destroy armies with, but it is very thematic, and it might kind of be something that you as a DM can play with. Maybe as a Moon Dragon approaches, the tide all of a sudden starts to go out or come in at full force, which seems weird, especially to any players who might have survival knowledge and know that that's not supposed to be happening. There's lots of little tiny things you can do that could herald the arrival of a moon dragon, and all of them kind of set the tone for something horrific. Moon dragons can be absolutely brutal if you use them the right way. They are not giant bags of hit points you can just throw at a party and expect a good encounter. But if you put enough planning into your encounter and enemy design, the same way a moon dragon would put into all of its schemes, you are bound to have an experience those players will never forget. The perfect situation for a moon dragon would be setting up its lair nearby a village or settlement that is predominantly occupied by lycanthropes. Maybe the people there live in constant fear because this moon dragon, who they're now forced to serve, is just residing on this mountain and once every 14 days when it's in its full moon phase, it comes down and dominates them and forces them to attack other nearby towns or villages. And that could be a very interesting plot hook, is maybe there have been a lot of lycanthrope attacks against several towns and villages where the lycanthropes who lived in the mountains were known to be pretty peaceful before. Maybe they even had good relationships with the other peoples that were settled in the area, but all of a sudden, once every full moon, they just become ravenous and start coming to the town and slaughtering, looting, pillaging, and now your party has to figure out why. The other angle you could take here is that maybe the lycanthropes are serving willingly, or they're not being dominated and used as minions. Well, the dragon would still probably consider them minions, but they do so willingly, the same way kobolds might serve a dragon of the same chromatic or metallic color as them. These lycanthropes serve the moon dragon, revering it almost as a godlike being. In either case, you're bound to have at least a good and interesting area set up, and if your players choose to engage with that or you make it a main part of your campaign, it could be very fascinating. One last thing that I added pretty late in my conversion process for this creature was just the idea of another phase of the moon. 
because we've all seen a full moon or a new moon and crescent moon, everything in between. But once in a while, the moon does things that it doesn't usually do. I, of course, am talking about what is commonly referred to as a blood moon. In real life, this is known to only occur usually once every 19 years or so. And if you've ever seen one, you know exactly how ominous it can be. A massive crimson orb rising in the night sky, the color of blood. It is an extremely unsettling thing to behold, and with a creature like a moon dragon that literally replicates the phases of the moon and has a very real impact on its personality and its capabilities, what does a blood moon mean? I included in the stat block a variant phase for the moon dragon where when a blood moon appears it gets access to all of its spells and of course a couple extra ones including absorb water as it has that same sway over water that it normally has but now it has that sway over blood and it's just drawing that blood out of any creatures that it sees fit to destroy and of course its alignment changes as well when it goes into a blood moon phase but it does not remain evil or neutral or even good of course there wasn't really an alignment that i thought fit so during a blood moon the moon dragon becomes unaligned and it simply goes on a rampage. It pulls all of its followers with it and goes for seven days and seven nights just destroying sways of the countryside and absorbing all the blood that comes across its path. This is the most dangerous time to be on the same plane of existence as a moon dragon. Unfortunately, at least in the real world, it would only happen once every 19 years. Now because it's so uncommon, this is totally optional and you don't even have to use that rule if you don't want to, but it could be a very interesting point of contention where if the players find out that a blood moon is coming in several months and then they find out about this moon dragon at some point as well, it will raise the question to them, well what's going to happen? And then if they find out what's going to happen, how do they stop it? It puts a very real timer on the clock for them because if it gets to the point where that blood moon rises and that moon dragon is still present, it's going to be bad. Now, we've talked about the sun dragon and the moon dragon and kind of some ways that we could use these creatures, but what we have not talked about is some ways that we could use them together. So, bear with me for a moment and we will talk about some... Now, as I've said, these dragons are very much two sides of the same coin. One chaotic good, one ranging on the term of law to chaos, but very, very evil. Now, one ability these dragons both possess that is very unique to them is that they know immediately when one of their counterparts is within a few hundred miles. Lore-wise, this is because the origins of these dragons is very different than the others. While all the chromatic dragons, the evil dragons, they kind of all come from the same place and worship the same god, and all of the metallic dragons also kind of come from the same place and worship the same god, these dragons are both dragons that exist above, at least in their opinion, those cycles. While moon dragons may be evil, they don't even consider chromatic dragons worth their time. And while sun dragons may be very good, they wouldn't ever consider aligning themselves with metallic dragons because there's simply no reason to. The way a dragon thinks about a human life as being mere minutes as far as they're concerned, a celestial dragon like the sun or moon dragon might consider chromatic and metallic dragons to be very short-lived. And while they are considerably more powerful than most of the other dragons, they don't even consider their commonalities to really be that relevant. They pretty much stay out of the politics of other dragons unless, of course, it were to directly affect them. However, this also means they kind of share this same level with each other, which of course makes them bitter rivals because you could not find two creatures more different from one another in terms of ideals and philosophy. So depending on whether your party is more leaning towards good or evil, you could have them have a problem with one of these dragons and entreat the other to help them in this fight. And knowing this bitter rivalry between the two, it's very likely that dragon would agree. It's also possible you have a dragon approach the party. Maybe you have a sun dragon who says, look, there's this oppressive moon dragon who is dominating these poor werewolf populations, and I need your help to save them from their own madness. Now, all of that is very interesting to me, 
But if you don't find that kind of thematic very useful, you could, of course, throw all of that away and maybe the Sun and Moon Dragons are actually allies because there are tons of stories with the Sun and Moon, while being very different, they cooperate because they realize the other is necessary. So perhaps you have kind of a Sun Deity-esque dragon who oversees the land during the day and then the Moon Dragon counterpart does the same thing during the night. Could be a very interesting kind of political landscape to shape with different factions following different dragons. While they're not necessarily in direct conflict with each other, they would definitely have different views and philosophies and that would be reflected in their followers for sure. But at the end of the day, no matter what you decide to do with these creatures, whether you use the lore that I presented to you or more traditionally what we find in Spelljammer or you make up your own, I really hope you use these creatures and find them to be just memory makers for your D&D campaign because they are very fascinating and cool creatures. There is a part of me that hates converting dragons because it takes so long because each one of them you need four stat blocks for and in this case we ended up doing two different dragons so that was eight stat blocks which at the end of the day the monster manual style stat block that i do for my patrons ended up being nine pages long which is just crazy it was so much work but it was so fun to work on because these creatures are so fascinating and i do owe you guys an apology because this video took a lot longer to make than i thought it would but I also wasn't planning on making nine pages worth of content, so at the end of the day, I'm very happy with how these creatures turned out, how they came together. I know I'm definitely going to use both of them in my own homebrew D&D campaign, and hope that you think they're as useful and interesting as I do, because these guys were just so much fun to make. And you know, if we do end up getting that 5th edition Spelljammer book, we've already got these two awesome dragons prepped and ready for your adventures in space. Don't hold your breath on that, but I know I will be. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. Um, if you have any suggestions for monsters that aren't dragons that you'd love to see converted for 5th edition, please leave a comment or get at me on Discord and I will absolutely add them to the list and maybe you'll see them in a future video. But as for right now, I am heading off to probably take a nap and contemplate my existence. Just so many snap blocks. And of course, if you do want to use these monsters, you, as I mentioned, can find the Google document stat block in the description below, which has everything you need to run these creatures successfully in your game. And if you are one of my awesome patrons, you can get the full nine page PDF up on my Patreon. And that does, of course, include a bit more detailed backstory and of course, layer actions and also regional effects which you see with all those big legendary monsters and how these two creatures kind of impact the very land around them just by settling on the material plane. So if you are one of my patrons or you would like to be, definitely check that out. You can find the link in the description below there as well. So once again, thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next video. Till then.